everybody welcome back to my channel it is me once again here with another book review i think before we get into the book though let's go over a couple of different updates um just from like the past video in that video i think i mentioned how many subscribers and views i had i literally don't know what happened but everything blew up massively after that video and now i'm at over 1500 subscribers oh my goodness can we believe it i can't believe it this is like insane i didn't think anybody was gonna like the videos i mean some people didn't but not my problem if you guys follow my instagram you probably saw that i've been posting about like the views right now or at over 33,000 views and i'm like amazed and all of the support for the past two videos so i'm very happy i really appreciate it but in today's video we're going to be reviewing a, another book like i've said for like the 18th million time because i love repeating myself and today's book is actually going to be one by an author that we've already talked about uh no it's not the marquee said <laughs> it is once again our bff for life Eric LaRocca. Now, in my first video, I didn't really talk much about Eric LaRocca other than the fact that he is a splatterpunk uh, author. Uh, they have written various different books, um, all kind of falling under a very similar genre. And last time we got a chance to read, uh, things have gotten worse since we last spoke. And I gave it a pretty like mid review. I will say after reading the book one more time and reviewing my notes for the book, I'd probably lower the rating I gave it, but we won't talk about that. Uh, this time I actually got the chance to read his other book, which is called You've Lost a Lot of Blood. And uh, I actually even put up a poll asking what video you guys wanted to see next. And this one was the one with the most votes on it. So I was like, let's go ahead and talk about it. I got the, uh, the opportunity to read this book and I will say, uh, I really did not enjoy this book at all. I saw a lot of mixed reviews about it online, just like I did with the first book. It's always mixed with this with this person. Always mixed reviews. And I think, uh, just like I did in the first video, let's check out a couple of different reviews for um, our BFF Eric so we can go ahead and take a look at what other people think about this book. So this book has a 3.3 out of 5 on Goodreads. And by the way, someone asked me for my Goodreads. I'm such a fake, like, book girly. Like, I don't even have good reads. <laughs> the main consensus that I got from this book is the fact that everybody's confused. And I have to say, I was very confused, too. I was very, very confused about this book. Uh, and I still am. I think my favorite review has to be this one from someone named Narc. And the review just says, it's one out of five. So they didn't like it at all. And it's just, what was the point? <laughs> I think, like... Oh, Jesus. Okay, let's take a look at another review. I, I'm gonna start going on a tangent if I don't, like, at least, like, clear out my mind. Okay, let's let's read a good review. Um, where's- why are there no 5 out of 5s? Okay, let's, let's read this review by uh, Destiny Howling Libraries. Now that I've experienced this bizarre little treat, I don't even know how to possibly describe you've lost a lot of blood without spoiling it. There's a very good reason the synopsis for this story is so brief and vague. You need to go into it without knowing what to expect. In fact, even if I did tell you what to expect, spoilers and gets and all, I'm still not sure anybody can be fully prepared for the sheer unraveling chaos within these pages. Destiny has a much more positive view of this book than I do because while she calls it unraveling chaos, I call it a mess. Take the how you will. You've Lost a Lot of Blood is a book about our two main characters, Ambrose and Martyr. Uh, and their strange relationship that they have with each other and the bad things that they do. I went into this reading this very small vague description and thinking to myself, oh, that sounds a lot like things have gotten worse since we last spoke, but you know, I'm all about reading a book about a serial killer and the way that his partner like helps him out and it's just like all kinds of like weird messed up vibes, right? I'm like, cool, that sounds like a good book. The problem is that wasn't what it was about at all. When we get into this book, uh, it follows a very, very similar format to Things Have Gotten Worse Since We Last Spoke, where at the very beginning, we get a small like little disclaimer regarding what's gonna happen inside of the book. Except this time, instead of being like a police report, it's an editor's note written by a guy named Trent who had dated Ambrose in the past. This book is extremely disorganized. Inside of this one book, this novella, we have the story of Ambrose and Martyr, which I thought was what the whole book was going to be about. But no, 
we don't only just have that. We also have a couple of poems written by Martyr, Martyr Black, that's his name. And we also have a novella written by Martyr Black as well. So we have a novella inside of a novella written by one of the characters inside of the novella. But let's actually go ahead and get started firstly with that editor's note because that's going to bring us uh, into the first kind of beginning of the actual book. Uh, now our editor's note, which was written by Trent, Ambrose's ex-boyfriend, I think he's a journalist. Uh, we get a very small introduction to our two characters. My notes say a gay mentally ill couple composed of two people who are bad for each other. That's what I wrote in my notes. So lovely for me. I... It's basically things have gotten worse since we last spoke. Uh, our two main characters, Martyr and Ambrose, are, poor are two uh, wacky, weird guys. Martyr is a bizarre man known for his weird sexual preferences. That's what Trent describes him as. And we kind of get a little backstory to him and his upbringing where he's always been like a weird kid. He's been kind of like a like the bad kid all his life. Meanwhile, Ambrose has had a very, very good upbringing and he's been um, just like an overall good guy. And Trent describes him as easy to pleasure and easy to learn. We also get a little mentioning by Trent about what's to come in the book and he tells us neither of these seemingly prosaic upbringings could have informed or precluded the life that Martyr and Ambrose would enjoy together because they're a couple you know they're in love um nor would we get to know about the horrible things they would do to not only one another but to others as well immediately after Trent tells us this book is composed of writings by Martyr Black consisting of letters poems transcript evidence and then a novella that he wrote why? It all makes sense in the end. Kind of. I immediately notice this book is not in order. I get something like a little story or a poem that Martyr wrote. And I'm like, okay, cool. I can do some investigation on what this could be about. And then immediately after, I get chapters one to three of the novella. Oh, instead what we're going to do is we are first going to talk about the novella. I'm going to gloss over the poems because I promise they do not add much from the to the plot from what they contain and then we are going to talk about the dynamic between Ambrose and Martyr and then we are going to go ahead and talk about the ending because the last conversation between Ambrose and Martyr is what wraps up this entire book. So let's go ahead and get started with the novella inside of the novella which is also called You've Lost a Lot of Blood. The novella inside of the novella is also called You've Lost a Lot of Blood. And in this short novella that we get that is written by Martyr Black, we get a story about a girl and her little brother and how they head over to her new job. She's going to be a live-in uh, software engineer for this video game creator. And she's going to go ahead and start working on the game that she's always dreamed of working and then weird things start to happen. That's kind of what this novella is all about. First thing I will mention is the first mistake of having this novella inside of a novella is the fact that you can't fill in space in your book by having a mid story inside of a mid story. It's not gonna work because then instead of being overall mid, everything just becomes bad. I did not enjoy the story at all. I don't think it was disturbing and I didn't think it added much to the plot line other than just existing. So in this story, we're introduced to Tamsin and her little brother Presley, but both of them start off in a car covered in motor oil and there's a lighter beside Tamsin. What was she gonna do? Oh my goodness. And even she's wondering like, what was I gonna do? Cause she has no memory of what just happened, like literally at all. So she goes ahead, fixes herself up. Cause she's like, where are we? We gotta get to our destination. I gotta get to work, which is a weird thing to <laughs> Think about after finding yourself covered in motor oil she goes ahead and opens up her trunk and she finds a wooden pine tree carving inside and she's like what is that but i promise this pine tree is important for the plot line so remember the tree remember the tree i'm gonna put it right here remember the tree and she also finds a costume and she's like here you go presley put this on and it's an elvis presley costume eventually they find a washroom and they clean themselves off and then she's like oh no when my headlights is broken i gotta go find a replacement headlight and I gotta put in some gas because we need some gas for our journey that we're gonna have ahead of us. So they go ahead, find a little shop, and she's like, 
hey girl do you have headlights and the owner's like you can look whatever and she's like okay cool i'm gonna fill out my gas and then she goes ahead and looks for a headlight has headlight while she's looking for the headlight she literally sees a monster and they're like oh my god what is that and her brother comes running at her and they're like that was so weird just glossing over the fact that there's a little demon right there and then she goes ahead and decides to talk to the shopkeeper and they have a really weird conversation this is something that i mentioned in the first uh video that i made where eric laroca has this problem where they have a really hard time making their character's conversation sound like natural and like there's two people distinctly speaking to each other i would have appreciated some more descriptive uh explanations as to how these characters are speaking what emotions they're presenting as well because it just sounds like two ai generated robots talking to each other anyways the reason why she's talking to the shopkeeper is because presley came running at her because he's like oopsies i broke a pine tree carving where did that come from and they make tamson pay for it because the shopkeeper's like that's literally like you break it you buy it you got to take that with you and she buys it and then eventually she puts it in her trunk but she already had one oh my god isn't that so weird then something hilarious happens tamson asks the shopkeeper hey do you know where the zimpongo estate is by the way zimpongo is the name of the guy who owns like the big video game company and who she's gonna work for so she's looking for the zimpongo house and then the shopkeeper says he's waiting for you only the boy can destroy him and then her eyes roll to the back of her head and a black centipede comes out of her stoma because she has a stoma slithers up her throat and she like bites down on it eventually they end up running out they're like nah get we're getting out of here and they run out of there and they speed away to the zampango estate and eventually they reach it they reach the destination Woo! and it's like this huge it's literally huge like it's described as this giant mansion like estate like they have so much property and there's these creepy statues everywhere anyways when they get to the house they end up meeting nadia who is the nurse of mr zampango and she welcomes them into the house and she starts a little tour for the both of them and that is essentially chapters one two three of the novella after that we get to chapters four to six which i didn't write much notes for because a lot of this was just um i would say filler there's not much interesting things going on in this portion of the book and they're kind of like touring the house around and tamson's like so where's the other employees and Nadia's like, what other employees? She's the only person working on this project. They have her working all alone. Like, I know, like, the economy's bad and there's, like, a recession. But come on, like, get her some help. They're, like, walking around. And Tamsin's like, oh, my God. So when am I going to read Mr. Simpango? Because, like, she's, he's my icon. I love him. And Nadia's like, ooh. <laughs> and Tamsin's like, oh, okay, why, though? And they find out that Mr. Zamboni was in an accident and he's like all bandaged and wrapped up and no one can talk to him because he's a mummy he's a literal mummy and tamson's like okay cool <laughs> i guess i can't talk to him and he's like in this he's in his own room and he's locked up by like fingerprint and no one can get in like no one has the actual like pass to get in other than his sister who is kind of overseeing everything for him instead tamson learns she's gonna be working on a game called you've lost a lot of blood Oh my god, when they mentioned the title of the book in the book. Anyway, she's like, okay, cool, like, where am I gonna stay? And then Nadia's like, you're gonna stay on, like, in, like, the west end of the building. Which is crazy, the fact that they have a whole west end. And, um, Tamsin's like, I thought I was gonna get a carriage. Can I get a carriage home instead? That's what I was told. And Nadia's like, fine, okay, cool, let's take you to the carriage. And they walk over to the carriage home outside of the estate and they meet Danny. Who is Danny? I don't know. She's implied to be kind of like a groundskeeper, gardener kind of girl because I, maybe I'm dumb. Maybe I didn't see it. I don't have the actual EPUB file in front of me. I don't know if I missed it. It literally did not say what her job was. And immediately, like, you can tell Danny and Tamsin are like, oh my god, I think she's cute. <laughs> oh my god, like. Okay, so they get to the carriage home. They're like, woohoo! This is our new home for now. This is to new beginnings. And Tamsin puts Presley to sleep. And he's like, 
Okay, cool. We find out that Tamsin's like a raging alcoholic. She literally drinks a whole bottle of vodka and she, when she gets to bed, she's like, Kh. and then she wakes up and she's like, why is my bedroom a laundromat? So she's in the laundromat and she's like, okay, that's really weird. And a giant metal monster pops out of nowhere. And she's like, hello, what? who are you? Like, what the heck? And she runs back to Presley's room because like the that's her like safety and she's like oh my god ah and Presley's like what happened and she's like don't worry about it just go back to sleep and she ends up falling asleep too I don't know how probably the vodka but anyways she falls asleep in Presley's room and realizes when she wakes up she threw up and slept in she's late to her first day of work Mr. Zampango is gonna be so mad oh my god I forgot he's a mummy never mind oh my god and this is so sad like this actually I was like oh she wakes up and Presley's like sweeping the broken vodka bottle shards. <laughs> Nadia comes in and is like, Presley, do you want to go to the library? And Tamsin, you can get to work. And Tamsin's like, I'm going to come. I'm not letting you take my little brother alone. And Nadia's like, no, it's okay. <laughs> and Tamsin's like, no, I'm coming. And they're like, okay, cool. And they bring along Danny too, because she's there. Nadia brings them to a gigantic building called the Silo. And it's a building to house a private gaming center, which is pretty cool if you ask me. That's really cool. And the entire building is a replica of the game You've Lost a Lot of Blood, which is pretty cool, actually. Like, I'm not even joking at this point. That's actually really sick. I would love to see that. And it houses a fully immersive VR simulator that Presley just decides to climb inside. And Presley's like, yeah, I'm gonna play this. And Nadia's like, that's okay, don't worry. I'm gonna go with him so he's good. And Tamsin's like, no, I'm gonna go. And then this is where something weird happens. Presley's like, you're not gonna come with me. And Tamsin's like, oh, why? And Presley's like, I want Nadia to come with me. Not you, you little skunk. Okay, he did not say that. I <laughs> just like adding things up. Presley and Nadia go inside of the game, and then Danny and Tamsin decide to have their little moment, their little romance going on, and they have like like a moment of intimacy. And Tamsin's like, my parents died in a car crash. And Danny's like, oh, okay, cool. And Tamsin's like, well, like if, we, if, we, if it weren't for him, they wouldn't have been driving. And Danny's like, who is him? Like, what are you, girl, what are you talking about? And Tamsin's like, oops, <laughs> uh, I meant that's what that's what Presley said. Oh my god, like he just blames himself. You know, I feel so bad he blames himself. And Danny's like, no, that's what you just said. You said if it weren't for him. And then they're interrupted by the game going, ew, ew, and it's like freaking out. By the way, let me explain how the game works. To enter the game, you gotta go in behind the door, sit down, get like all your stuff on, and then the door closes, and the color of the door um kind of denotes what your status is. So green is good red means something bad so nadia's door turns red and a skull and crossbones appear over the outline of her body on the screen where they're watching like their their like health and everything like that and they get like a whole system malfunction and then presley's uh door turns red too and then that's when tamsin freaks out she's like <gasps> presley and then um they're like oh my god oh my god let me try to stop the game and they press like the stop button nothing's happening they can't stop the game Oh! crazy stuff and then nadia's door turns green and her door opens and she's literally sitting there dripping covered in black sludge and it kind of looks like motor oil and she's like covered in motor oil and she's like Ugh! and presley's door opens up too except oh my god he's not sitting there anyways they're like presley's missing we gotta call the police and the police shows up and they're like well i guess we'll file another report and tamson's like what do you mean another report? We've never filed a report. And the police is like, let me ask, ask the, the audience. audience. And like literally shows a report that they filed a week before with a photo that Presley took of himself that same day. So how did they get the photo from a week ago? If they, he took it that day, Tanson asks like something like, oh my God, like what happens if we don't find him? And the police is like, we're stuck here until he sets us free. That's not what she asked you. What are you talking about? <laughs> but at this point, it is very, very obvious. They're in a time loop, okay? It's very obvious. We could, I, I could tell immediately from like the tree, the pine tree reappearing. I was like, oh, they're in a time loop. 
Okay, cool. Anyways, later that night, after Tamsin spends the whole day freaking out, Presley appears out of the forest covered in black oil. And Tamsin's like, oh, Presley! And then she helps him like clean up, of course, because he's covered in motor oil. They have like a really weird, awkward conversation uh, where Presley like literally hates her. Like he's like, I don't want to talk to you. And, and Tamsin's like, okay, I'll let you clean yourself. And she doesn't notice that there's wire slithering under her brother's skin. <gasps> tea the next morning tamson wakes up and presley is back to his normal self he's like eh, i'm me again and tamson's like okay and she calls to retract the police report oh my god there's the time loop and the line cuts out and someone tells her that it's all gonna start over again and tamson's like what the heck and she hangs up tamson starts working on the game and she finds a giant break in the code that could allow the player to pretty much like break the game and do whatever they want to do and she's like what the heck and she's like let me go show someone so she goes to show miss zampango which is the sister of mr zampango and she is literally just in her room crying and screaming uh very relatable and tamson's like okay bye <laughs> she leaves mr Zamp miss zampango alone because she's like i'm not gonna deal with this right now and then she's like let me go ahead and check on mr zambungo and she passes by his room and she's like this poor dude and she puts her hand on the scanner and the door opens and she's like ah okay and she just decides to walk in as if she didn't just do something that she was very explicitly told not to do in his room she notices that there's literally an oil spot by his pillow like okay this dude is definitely a robot or something this is not a real person and she finds one of presley's origami swans in the room and she's like oh my god when did presley get in here like i'm gonna go punch this little boy and she's horrified and she is like no one's allowed in here so how is this here and she like zooms out she's like let me get out of here and she ends up going to nadia and she's like nadia look at what i found this is literally an origami swan and nadia's like that is really weird that you found that that's really weird and i'm confused then at nighttime tamson and presley have another awkward conversation because he's a l moody little kid and tamson notices a really sharp bump on his face she's like did you get like rhinoplasty or something um and it's like metal and she like is like oh let me get that for you and she goes to touch it and it just disappears and she's like oh danny shows up and tamson confides in her that she thinks something happened to presley when he went into that game because obviously he's very much changed his demeanor has changed he's all metallic he got rhinoplasty like what happened to him while he was in there and she also confines that she does indeed brain blame presley for what happened to their parents um because uh it's mentioned or at least hinted at that their parents passed away in an accident actually what happened was they were out driving uh because of something that presley wanted to do and if it weren't for Presley, they wouldn't have gone driving out that night where they got into the car crash. And she also mentions to Danny that she actually tried leaving Presley at a laundromat a couple of months ago. And she felt like this immense guilt. So she went back to, um, to get him and she was like, oh, sorry, it was just a mistake. I didn't mean to leave him there. So we know that Tamsin is very much dealing with these feelings of guilt and anger because she feels very upset about the fact that her parents passed away and she blames presley but she also is super guilty and she feels bad because she's presley's only guardian at this point and she's dealing with alcoholism her parents passing away trying to find a stable job for her and presley to be able to survive and um she starts making out with danny okay and then they start like they start doing a little bit more than making out, if you know what I mean. And while they're doing what they need to do, I guess, uh, Danny turns, uh, like, Tamsin's like, yay! And she doesn't really, like, see what's going on. And she hears, like, metal scraping against metal. And she's like, that's not a familiar sound <laughs> to hear when you're doing that. And she's like, and she looks down, and... <laughs> She sees like the metal monster that's been appearing over and over again between her legs instead of Danny. And she freaks out, of course. And she's like, ah! And Danny like ends up being Danny again. And she's like, what, what, what's happening? And Tamsin's like, get out of here. Get out. And Danny's like, okay. And she runs out like 
whatever. The next morning, Tamsin is working on the project, but she is like working on the files and she finds one containing a Mr. Zampango interview that he did. And she starts watching it because she's nosy. And she's watching him answer questions or asking him about the game, You've Lost a Lot of Blood. And then he's questioned about the Chalice family. Who is that? And then the interview is cut short because he's like, I'm not going to answer any questions about this. Goodbye. And they cut it. Tamsin is like, okay, cool. Let me Google what this is all about. And she Googles Simpango Chalice incident and ends up finding an obituary for someone named Danny Chalice. And you know who this Danny Chalice is? That's right, it's the same Danny she was doing the do with literally the night before. But apparently she's dead. Danny died March 12th after experiencing a brain aneurysm. And her mother was saying that after she went an all access path to the new gaming technology at the Zimpango estate in the silo, she was never the same very similar to a certain little boy dressed up like Elvis Presley. I would have never expected this in the storyline. Tamsin accidentally like hits a lever or whatever and it ends up opening up a door and she's like, let's go see what this is. Let's go adventuring. And she walks into the little door and she ends up heading down a passage that the door unlocks and she goes down until she finds like a whole altar thing. And she's like, Ah, cool, we got some Christians. Um, except it's not a Christian altar. <laughs> That's just me making things up, guys, by the way. <laughs> she did not think it was a Christian altar. It's just a regular, regular altar. And she finds her phone that they took away earlier on in the story, Presley's camera that they also took away, and Danny's earring. What? So she takes all of them because she's a little thief. And she takes them back to her room. Tamsin is like, we gotta get out of here because this place is crazy. So she scurries and she tries to get Presley. Um, she's like packing her stuff. Presley's behind her. So imagine that she's like, oh my God, Presley, this is so weird. Like I've got to grab my stuff. I got to put it all together. Like we got to get out of here. And she doesn't realize that behind her, Presley is transforming into a literal like monster like creature thing and she, she's too busy packing up and she starts running down and she's like i gotta go gotta go and she doesn't even realize that presley's not with her like there's no way you think about packing up your sweaters first and you forget about your brother and she's like oh shoot i gotta go get presley so she goes back up and she's like why are there little wires coming out of your skin like and she's like you're not Presley. And she locks him in his room and is like, I gotta get out of here and find the real Presley. And she locks him up and she's confronted by Danny. And she's like, hey girl. And she lights her on fire. <laughs> and there's literal like metal and wires underneath her skin. And she's like, oh, okay, cool. So no one is real here at all. You guys are all, you guys are all transformers. And then Tamsin's like, I gotta find Nadia. And then she like, she's like, okay, cool, let me go. And T Presley appears out of nowhere and starts running off. And she's like, Presley. And she goes off after him and she grabs her raincoat first. <laughs> On her way, like running around, she finds Nadia and she notices a little wire coming out of Nadia's hijab. And she's like, okay i see what's going on here and she starts beating her up and chasing her and she like grabs an axe and is like and she eventually catches her like when she's literally like dying and nadia ends up revealing that presley is actually still stuck inside of the game and that he was supposed to set them all free and break the loop how i don't know <laughs> tamson's like okay cool and kills Nadia. While she's looking for Presley though, she finds a trench literally filled with dead people. It's like a mass grave. And in this grave is Nadia, Danny, Mr. Zampango, and a random woman that she does not recognize like at all. And she's like, okay, well that's cool. Let me go um, go to the sea low because that's probably where Presley is. Now we're getting to the last two chapters. So we're, gonna, we're about to wrap it up. Uh, Tamsin gets to the silo and finds Presley. And she's like, I got to get into the game to get my little brother back. So that's exactly what she does. She straps her chair in, uh, door shuts in front of her, and she goes in. Inside of the game, she actually meets the convenience store woman again. And the woman is telling her like, 
You got to take the child to him. Capital H, uh, whoever that is, because uh, Presley is the only one that can break the loop and set everyone free. She enters like a labyrinth inside of the game and encounters a giant metal monster with Mr. Zampango's face on it. The walls start attacking her. Um, at some point, I just wrote LMFAO. <laughs> Uh, she fights them off because she's a girl boss and she keeps going and she eventually finds Presley instead of like a pod egg thing and he like like the pod like poops him out and she's like Presley and he's dead oopsies sorry Presley he died and a giant black centipede shoots out of him two other sacks like open up in front of them and drop stuff into like a canal that's near them and Tamsin is like what the heck is that? And you know what it is? It's literal copies of Tamsin and Presley. So they're the ones that are not going to restart the loop. Now, since Presley is dead, Tamsin has literally nothing she can do. Like, her brother is literally, like, gone. And Tamsin runs after the copies that came out of the little pods. And she loses them. And she's like, ah, okay, great. And she ends up reaching the hive to enter back to the real world out of the silo. Um, she brings Presley's body back to the main house and lays him on the floor. And she decides for everything that's happened today... She's going to enact revenge and she's going to go check on the crying that she hears, aka the crying of Miss Zempingo. She ends up finding Miss Zempingo, otherwise known as Iris, crying in the lap of Mr. Zambungo. And Tamsin's like, and stabs her literally straight away. Tamsin is like, you know what? I'm going to get you too. And she stabs Mr. Zambungo too. And he doesn't even move. And she's like, I just stabbed you like that's literally so weird and this is crazy she takes his goggles off because he's like completely covered and guess who he is he's presley what the heck he's literally presley and she's like what the heck and she looks at iris who's now on the floor and like the thing that's been covering her face is like peeled back now and iris is tamson what right like i actually did not see this part coming i gotta give it to you eric you you kind of ate with this one so iris who is aka the future tamson asked tamson how she could waste the second chance and she says that uh presley is gonna need her the next time this happens iris tells tamson that the next time they need to go into the game together that Presley is the only one who can destroy the engineer. So now we finally start understanding what's going on. Uh, we don't get any information as to how this loop started. But basically, um, it started and there's a certain engineer that needs to be defeated. Which I think we can presume is a giant monster that we've been seeing all about the story. Presley needs to go in with Tamsin so that they can feed the engineer together. Thus ending the loop that they've been stuck in this entire time. But... For some reason, they keep messing up because Presley tells Tamsin not to go into the game with him and they end up not doing it and it immediately makes the loop start all over again. Tamsin's like, oh my lord. And she is processing all this information and she leaves Iris's dead body and looks in the mirror and you know what she sees? She sees a gear turning in her cheek. So she's now been transformed into a puppet in this time loop which means she now needs to go ahead and set everything into place for the new copies that were made while she was inside of the game so she places everything like it was when she originally came she dresses up presley's body in bandages like mr zampango and puts on the headpiece that iris was wearing and she also disposes of the bodies of danny nadia and the two future copies in that trench once again resetting the loop to happen again. Nadia and Danny appear in a black sludge from the forest and Tamsin instructs them to follow the rules that were set in place at the very beginning. And the clones appear once again, like they did at the very beginning in Tamsin's car covered in the sludge with a lighter. And the story ends off with Tamsin imagining herself being a bird flying over the estate as the loop resets. And that is the end of You've Lost a Lot of Blood, the novella inside of the novella. Now that we've gotten the biggest part of the story out of the way, let's go ahead and talk about uh, what is supposedly the main story, 
which is Ambrose and Martyr, starting off with each one of the conversations that they have. The first thing that we get from uh, Ambrose and Martyr is something called Relics from the Night We Both Perished. This smaller um, portion of the story is something written by the point of view of Martyr, uh, talking about someone that he killed, someone that we don't know, only referred to as the wax priest and later on we find out what a wax priest is and how his ghost haunts his dreams appearing in the way he looked after he was murdered this person who wrote the actual story aka martyr lets us know that he does not like to be tied to people and he kills people uh specifically this person because he doesn't like to be tethered or kind of conjoined to anyone in any sort of way whether it be a relationship or not then we get something called stories you can't tell in parties which is a conversation between ambrose and martyr on february 12 2019 martyr talks to ambrose about a post that he saw online where a mom smashed her daughter's face into her birthday cake and the daughter ended up losing her eye on one of the wooden skewers by the way if you remember things have gotten worse since we last spoke you would know that i complained or I said that I didn't really enjoy the fact that a lot of the conversation and a lot of the story was filled up with um, the characters talking about these really morbid, weird stories to each other and kind of discussing them rather than having actual fulfilling conversations where we see like their dynamic. Eric does the exact same thing in this book too. Um, almost every conversation Ambrose and Martyr have, one of them has to talk about a strange story and they just discuss it or argue about something or have a debate about something regarding that story. Oh my god, I hate this book. <laughs> After this, we get something else called I Drown You in Dark Water If You Weren't So Beautiful, which is a story recounting the first time uh, Martyr actually killed someone, which was by slashing their throat with a pocket knife. And he recounts how lovely his victim looked and the pleasure he got from seeing this person unalived. And how every time he kills someone, uh, we know that he takes a limb or something and how from this murderer he left with only the index finger of the person that he killed next up we have something called tome girl uh gif which is once again ambrose and martyr having a conversation about a story that they saw online while they're doing something else i actually wrote some notes here too i wrote eric struggles to differentiate these two characters and instead of having the characters actually develop and form their own personalities he resolves to having his characters share random stories to each other to fill the void of having to have an actual conversation which is kind of what i mentioned earlier on just more intelligently when my brain was actually functioning and completely awake but marty talks about the story of a girl we only know as tone girl a girl who went home with a random man that she met at a bar and was promised all the drugs and food she wanted only for the sole condition that she stayed in the man's basement for the rest of her life. I would actually like to hear more about her story than about Anne Rose and Martyr at this point because not very interesting to be honest. And they talk about the story and they didn't have a discussion on whether or not originality exists. And this idea of sharing a stories that we got from the last one and this idea of originality of originality is also something very very important specifically to martyr because he at this point we know he is an author he wrote the novella inside of the novella he also wrote the poems that we see kind of scattered throughout the book too so remember the topic of originality as well because he mentions that originality does not really exist at all and that's what his belief is and this is something that we see play, play a really big part to the end of the book. Next up, we have something called Body is Made of Honeycomb, where Martyr tells us about the person he was with before Ambrose and how he was completely enamored and infatuated with this dude. Now, Martyr did indeed kill this guy, and the reason why he killed him was because he shared something completely abhorrent with him like i'm not gonna lie this is absolutely disgusting this is the most disgusting thing in the book that we see definitely a lot cleaner of a book compared to things have gotten worse since we last spoke but essentially the guy that he was with would pretend to be the relative of a random cancer patient doing chemotherapy and he would go into their room and re relieve himself um sexually in that room because he got pleasure from seeing people in this sort of state 
and Martyr is like, oh, so he kills him, rightfully so, <laughs> by smashing a bottle over his bat, over his head, and then uh, stabbing him with it. Martyr wonders about whether or not he is as bad as this person that he was in a relationship with because he kills, but he ends up finding out that there's a whole group of these people who call themselves wax priests which goes back to that story that we saw before and martyr decides that it's his job to find these people and to kill them the next story that we get is called all that happiness makes me sad and the main purpose of this one is a conversation between ambrose and martyr while they're cleaning up a victim's blood and they discuss whether or not some people want to be alive. And then they also discuss the theory of animal suicide, which is probably one of the most interesting conversations that they've had at this point. But, you know, that's not really saying much compared to everything else. Now, after this, we get to the last conversation between Martyr, Black, and Ambrose. And I'm so happy because this book was honestly a pain to get through. But we're there oh my god we're at the end <gasps> and this story is called or this recounting is called parasite and we begin with ambrose telling martyr that he's lost a lot of blood and what happened was uh ambrose found martyr after martyr had stabbed his own neck with a pan and ambrose tells martyr that he saw everything that he was writing um and that he had written in the book the novella the poems and he saw that everything was actually stolen from the different victims that he had killed. So at this point, the conversations that they've been having before make a lot more sense because now we get the context as to why Martyr had these specific views. But Martyr had killed people so he could steal their stories and that's why he hated himself because deep down, he had this guilt over the fact that he was not creative, he was not original, he couldn't actually write and he had to steal these stories from other people. Ambrose kind of tells Martyr that he needs to go to a hospital, he needs to fix himself because he's bleeding, he's losing a lot of blood, and Martyr says he can't go to the hospital, and that he and Ambrose should actually go somewhere far away, uh, that their brains are teeming with little parasites that are guiding them towards destruction, but that he'd rather be there than here. And that is the end of the conversations between Ambrose and Martyr. And we are left with one final thing, a final note from the editor, our BFF, Trent. Now, Trent doesn't really give us a lot of information. He essentially just tells us that, uh, thank, like, thank you to like the victims, families for allowing us to publish this. Um, Martyr Black's whereabouts are currently unknown. And the book is essentially just a collection of plagiarism from various victims collected by Martyr Black. And that is the end of You've Lost a Lot of Blood. And now it's time for my thoughts. I felt like reading this book was the most unenjoyable experience I've had in a long time because I was so insanely bored, extremely bored by this book. And I did not enjoy reading it at all for various different reasons, and let's discuss why. My main concern with this book, and something that I'd have to check out by reading more of Eric LaRocca's books, which I'm not sure if I want to do after this one, to be honest, is the fact that the formatting and the story is so similar to Things Have Gotten Worse Since We Last Spoke, um, that I don't know if I would want to put myself through reading yet another book where I am experiencing the same thing over and over again. And I will say this book was actually less enjoyable than things have gotten worse since we last spoke because of the fact that it was so all over the place, honestly. We once again get this queer tragedy trope, which I mentioned already that I don't really enjoy. And unfortunately, lots of books have it. We can't just have gay characters having happy endings for anything. And I'm literally making eye contact with a little life on my top shelf where my dresser is. And I know I'm going to have to eventually talk about that book. And I'm not excited because that's worse than this one for sure. But we get that queer tragedy trope. And we get this really confusing pacing and unrealistic conversations. Which I mentioned throughout the book as I read it. That I don't enjoy. We also get a problem from Eric where things he writes are obviously written by him. He doesn't have a 
the ability to differentiate between the characters at all or give them any sense of personality. The book also seemed very edgy in a way that I just was like, why do we need like the centipedes everywhere? The novella didn't really have a great storyline either. <laughs> and the plot of that book within the book was very predictable, extremely predictable. First chapter in, I kind of already knew where I was going and the biggest twist came from finding out Mr. Zamboni was Presley and Iris was Tamsin and all of that. But that was at the very end. And then immediately after I was like, oh, okay, cool. They're just gonna do the loop again, I guess. I also don't understand why it was called You've Lost a Lot of Blood when the story wasn't even about blood. It was about machinery. I felt like the the way that this book, this book, the way that this book came across to me was a just conjunction of notes that someone had in their computer of different stories and poems and they needed to find a way to kind of tie them all together so they created this elaborate storyline of the serial killer writing the stories being an author putting them together and having murdered them have mur murdered the actual authors to make everything actually tie together i don't know nothing makes sense in this honestly it makes sense but in a way that is not natural for this book i honestly i i can't give it a good rating like at all i'm so sorry eric i'm gonna have to give this book a um a three out of ten just because i think the ideas were there they really were and honestly i have like a i have a whole rewritten version of how i would how i wanted this book to play out so if you guys want to see like my rewritten storyline of you've lost a lot of blood let me know i'll make a video on how i want to how i would at least write this book and how i would place these storylines as well but yeah I, I i just couldn't enjoy it honestly the writing really really killed it for me and you know bad writing was already something that i kind of experienced with the first book and this one really just felt like a letdown after the the other one as well we didn't get much splatterpunk in this book either i don't know if he was trying to go for a different genre but it was a no for me if you stuck this far with me thank you i appreciate it thank you so much for going through this book with me i read it so you don't have to if you want to i don't <laughs> i don't recommend it but you can go ahead and read it if you want to but if you stuck through it through the whole way with me thank you so much i really appreciate it and I appreciate someone listening to me blabber for almost an hour about this book that I had to read. I'll also be posting polls more consistently so I can see what you guys actually want to see from me, what kind of content you guys like. Um, and that way it's a little bit easier for me to push out the videos that you guys actually want from me. So it should be a little bit nicer. But I am planning on doing my next video on maybe something music related or on a different book but of course let me know what books you guys want me to read down in the comment section i have a pretty good list growing but of course i'm always happy to read more books and see what recommendations you guys have if you like this video uh feel free to subscribe and like it really helps me out and check out my socials as well if you want to be more updated on videos to come and how often they're going to come out as well but once again thank you guys so much for sticking with me this whole time and See you guys again in the next video.